99% of people become 75 years old and regret their life. And my therapist says, Philip, you can have all the success and all the money you want. Just be solely focused on that. But I promise you everything else will fall apart. How did you get into politics? Like, that, that is the place that I want to start. Why politics, how politics, what led you there? So it's really interesting. Um, I am, I don't, uh, Mark, I don't know how, how, how old are you? Or do you? I'm do you, 38. Okay, good. So uh, I got nine years on you. Just turn. Oh, you're three, old. You're so old. Man. 47. <laughs> um, and uh, so I was one of the first uh, generation of attention deficit disorder, ADD kids. Okay. They, they hadn't even invented ADHD at this point. It was just ADD. And I don't know when ADD became ADHD, but I don't either. Like I just shift. was diagnosed diagnosed with it in the 1980s and given Ridlin and, you know, shoved on my way. Hey, here's your, here's your, you know, your pills. See a 16 year old. And uh, the reason being is that I, I have, you know, I think a lot of great entrepreneurs have this problem as well as uh, I, I have massive ADD, right? And the, the good side of that is I can handle about 30 different things on my plate at once. And it really doesn't <laughs> affect me all that much, which most people would like, you know, like go crazy if they had that many things juggling at once. But at the same time, I can only do what I'm really passionate about. Just, it, it just, if, you know, I remember a friend of mine saying you should, when I was in college, they're like, cause I was 22 and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was like, I'm graduating. I have no clue. And some guys like, well, you should um, just go interview for this, uh, this company that sells truck beds. Oh man, they pay so good. It's like, and now this is, you know, 1996. So it's like, man, they, they, they paid $32,000 a year, but I mean, you know, 1996, that was good starting salary. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, I think I'd rather pull my eyeballs out than, uh, then tr go sell truck beds. Like, good God, could you imagine what it'd be like at 40 and say, that's my life. I, not that there's anything against that just for me personally. So there are only two things I really cared about growing up. And that was, uh, college football, which you're in Canada. So you may not be as familiar with college football. It's kind of like the minor leagues of, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm of the I'm NFL. The, it's the, the minor leagues of the level. NFL. It's just people play it in the, you know, at the, at the college they, level. Yeah. And they don't, they don't get paid for it. And all of the universities make a ton of money off. Well, of it. that's about to that's, change. That's why I go on ESPN so much as I talk <laughs> about that issue, but, um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm five, nine, a buck 50. I mean, I, I'm not playing college football. So, and the other thing is in high school, I just got really, uh, really fascinated and passionate about politics mm -hmm. and I didn't get involved. I didn't volunteer and do anything like that. I just love studying about political campaigns. And so at a certain point when I was 22, I just said, you know, maybe I should just go work on a political campaign. Uh, I like politics. And so I did. And you know, I got hooked. Uh, it was, it was 24 <clears> seven. <throat> um, uh, it is a, there was what a period. What, what, there was, was a, your, what was your first role? Were you like, you're the guy answering the phone? Oh yeah, oh, no, I was like the worst. I mean, my first, my first job was at a, um, I was like, uh, coordinating volunteers at a presidential convention. And then my second job, this is great. I was the assistant to the assistant to the, you know, executive director of this political organization. So I always say I wasn't even worthy enough to be someone's assistant. I was the assistant's so assistant. That was my like, first job. It's like Dwight on the office who keeps trying to say he's assistant office. Right. And by the way, assistant manager, but he's assistant to the, <laughs> yeah, that's what I was like, but here's the thing. Like that was in July of 1997. And you can be like, wow, that was a long, that was 24 years ago. Well, 24 years ago, I was, a, I was just an assistant's assistant. Right. And here we are talking today. It wasn't like, you know, I mean, it wasn't like, I, yeah, I don't know. I think we all have, I'm very grateful. I started in a humble way. Like yeah. that was a humbling job. I got fired from that job. And um, what, did, what did you do? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, this again, let me tell you how old I am. My, <laughs> I didn't understand. Email had just come out in the workplace. Right. And so um, the assistant that I worked for, right. I was the assistant's assistant. Uh, the assistant was just a horrific person. I mean, just a horrible, horrible human being. And, like at the time our desks were literally touching each other and 
this was before people never understand this, but like, if you want to have a conversation, you just had a conversation. You didn't just email someone and start talking to them. Like it's very normal now, but she emailed me and said, would you take the papers on my desk and run them upstairs? Now, literally she's sitting she emailed, from, like, emailed like, the from me and I'm like, this is the worst human being ever. Who does this? Like, so I forwarded the email to someone upstairs that I was supposed to drop the papers off. And I said, can you believe this horrible human being? I just dumped her. Right. Uh, and no, everybody didn't like accident? her. That was not going to be the problem. Everybody didn't like her. I wouldn't have you know, spoken out of school if I was a little nervous about that. And so she, uh, so anyway, the, my buddy that I emailed afforded the email to never responded back. I said, whatever. So I took the papers up there came back and my boss, the assistant literally goes, it's tears coming down her eyes. And she says, can I see you? And I go, okay. And she oh, no. prints out the email. Cause I had replied. And not <laughs> oh no. <laughs> you, and so you got fired. fired. Okay. You know, what's funny when I started my career, so I went to <laughs> film school and then uh, I graduated and I landed at, at uh, a franchise. I worked at the franchise or, and I'm like maybe in my first or second week at this company. And I'm responsible for producing a live event with like 1500 people there. Like I'm the person at the back. Yeah. I'm, I'm like 23, 23 yeah. or something. I'm running this event and someone on the team forwards me videos that they think is funny. And they're like, you know, this is back when you used to actually email videos out to people. Oh yeah. And it was a hoax about <laughs> trying to, it was a hoax, a fake video a prank about trying to um, scare PETA members. Anyway, he thought this was funny. I thought this was funny. The team had asked me to just to put stuff up in the break. They didn't yeah. hear anything. So I start playing <laughs> this video and, and it's this prank. And, and I remember the moment, like, like my heart can still stop because I remember the moment where there's 1500 people buzzing on break and suddenly yeah. there's silence, like, like a wave of silence <laughs> rippling through the crowd as they, as they're all stopping to say like, what is this video going up? And it's playing over the screens. It's echoing off the walls. And the person running the event is running up to me and going, what is going on? And I'm like, I was, I was told to play something. This guy thought it was funny. She's like, anyway, for the rest of the day, I'm sitting there. I'm like, I am going to lose my job. And, I am going to lose. And, I didn't. I, didn't. Uh, I was going to say, <laughs> maybe you were like the first person to ever get canceled. If that would have been a, like, yeah, know. but oh my goodness. Like, huh. so it still takes me back many, many, many years ago, but yeah. I get it, man. We've done some dumb things when we're young. It should give people hope though, that you can recover from these things. Right. So you, so you get fired and then, and then what you, you catch the political bug. No, I was working for a political organization. I just got another job somewhere else. And then eventually I wanted to go work like on, I was in Washington, DC, at these committees and these places where they, you know, raise money and then just spend on ads. And then I said, I really wanted to go work on the, the actual campaign of a candidate. And so I, I started doing that and I did it for about about four years and there was a three-year window between 2000 and 2002 those 2000 2001 2002 i had 20 22 days off total in three years mm -hmm. you work seven days a week you work 15 16 hours a day but you, you you're fighting for things you believe in and whether you hate politics or not you know um my belief is i'm you know there's a great quote by teddy roosevelt that's called man in the arena and like it's easy for people to sit there and criticize on the outside but i was i've been on the inside for 25 years trying to make things better fight for issues that i think the candidates and the parties that i help uh, should be believing in and, and and positioning their their constituencies around and you know um that's you know that's kind of what i did but i wanted to get my hands dirty and work on actual political campaigns and work for candidates so i did that and worked um you know uh, on a lot you know multiple presidential campaigns governor's races u.s senate races things like that and then uh, eventually I became a solopreneur in 2005 and I did that for nine years. I did that until 2014, but I got to the point where I had a great idea and I was a solopreneur. And at a certain point I realized my idea wasn't big enough. Hmm. And so at the end of 2014, I decided I was going to start an ad agency in politics. Okay. Before, before we get there, I, yeah. I have to go back a little bit in time. Go, go. So when you're young, I think it's easy to be, um, driven by purpose. And then I think when you're older, it's easy to be driven by purpose, but people get lost in their twenties, thirties, forties by right. all the stuff. Totally. Um, I, did. I loved politics. Like I always pictured myself going into politics and I followed it and I loved it. Um, and then I hit a point 
maybe 10 years ago where it was like, I became super, super uh, apathetic and cynical because of like the machine, because of the mm-hmm. system, because of the game. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm curious how you can spend time in there and maybe be addicted to the game and maybe love the game and maybe win. But how do you stay on the inside and not become cynical and apathetic and um, all of those things that, that turn good intentions into just like, well, you know, we, we'll, we'll do what we can do or it just becomes about winning. Yeah, no, I'm all of those things. I'm cynical. I'm apathetic. Uh, Are you? Well, I mean, there's a part of me, but I tend to put the finger on, I'm, listen, I think there's all, everybody is to blame, right? In society. I think just pointing to politicians and say they're the problem with everything is the wrong way of doing it. I believe the tip of the spear is actually the media, but the media drives the politician to act certain ways because they can get attention one way or the other, one network or another. Um, and then that just funnels everything. I, I think, then it got put on steroids with social media. Um, and then all of a sudden now we're seeing a different type of exposure uh, with the social media platforms with deplatforming and canceling. And, you know, and I've had to go through my own struggles on that side as well. And so um, I, here's the thing. When you work inside a political campaign, Mark, it's like um, you're working for a candidate. Let's just say it's um, a guy and you're like, you get to know that person. Let's just say it's an old white guy. Well, yeah, usually. Like, like could statistically, be. But I've worked let's for just plenty say. of women. I'm just saying. Like, no, I know. So I'm just politically joking. Correct. I just, I'm uh, just joking. But, you know, and, and like, I get to know that, that, that guy's wife and his family and his kids. And then I get to know the reason why he wants to run for office. And then you go, no, this is what I'm here for. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody's cynical. What you see in the media is one side of the story. And whether you're on the left or on the right, 90% of these candidates, you know, are trying to do the right thing. Maybe initially, I can't always say that once they get it, I, one of the things that I'm pretty cynical about is once people get elected, the power kind of changes them because they go from someone that's begging to get into office to now being the one where people come up and beg to them. Hmm. And I think that changes a person. And I've seen that happen a lot. Does that happen in business too? You think in what way? Well, I just think it's interesting to, to think that when you're striving for something, when you're trying for something, you're willing to take whatever hits you need to table scraps, you know, you're climbing up the ladder yeah. and then you hit a certain point, which again, I find interesting where you're not approaching people, people are approaching you. It changes the power dynamic. It changes your ego or perception of yourself. I imagine intoxicating, easy to get lost in all of those things. Yeah, I guess I, I would, I would just, the reason I asked that question, cause I have no idea. I, I, I'm sure that exists. I'm sure there are people out there, but I, I don't ever, I've never felt even a hint of that in my entire mm-hmm. life. Uh, I feel like I'm an underdog and everything. And I've always got to have sort of a little bit of them. I mean, not a little bit, it's, it's my entire mentality. I, I just don't even know. I honestly, I, I assume that's like people that catch, uh, lightning in a bottle and all of a sudden they think they were born on third base. Is that maybe where you're talking about? They come entitled yeah. like a politician comes entitled. Well, I mean, you've built a large organization. You hang out with people who have built very large organizations and you know, you could be sitting for drinks or for dinner or at the table in their backyard and they're totally normal people, but put them in a different context and they act different. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we're all actors in our own, in our own play of our life. Um, the question is, are you doing it with, authenticity. Like, you know, I, I get on this podcast and I can tell you, I can yarn some stories and I can entertain it. Cause I'm, I've done it. Literally I've done 500 interviews. If you get me off of this interview, I want to be quiet. I want to be thoughtful. I'd rather write than talk. Um, you know, the, am I being inauthentic? No, I don't know. I don't think so. But I think for a lot, I guess, I, I don't know. I just never surrounded myself with people like that. Hmm. And, and the politicians I've worked with that have changed, I didn't work for them anymore. I mean, I just made that decision. I made that decision a long time ago that I wasn't going to work for candidates that I didn't believe in or wouldn't do the right thing. And it's kind of the one thing I've, I guess, if you, you talk about title, maybe I don't work for businesses that aren't going to do the right thing. I, and I maybe I, and early in my corporate marketing life, I took a lot of clients early on to build my business. And I made some massive mistakes in that because I met some horrific business owners, right. Who were chasing dollars and not chasing to do the right thing for their customers or clients. And so, I mean, I definitely can, I guess I can see that, but I, I've really made a conscious choice, even from 
the time I was 23 years old to try to work for political candidates or corporate clients in a way that is more purpose driven. And mm -hmm. I, and then for me personally, I, I don't, I'm always, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know any other way. I'm always, I just think I just put my head down and get to work. I don't think about, I've made it. I'll, I know my wife will probably kill me. Cause she's like, why don't you ever celebrate more of your wins? And I just go, no, I'm, I'm putting my head down and just keep moving forward. And I, I, that's, so I don't really think about it that much, I guess. Do you live, I'm, I'm always curious for people, do you tend to live your life in the future or are you pretty present focused? Because I think people, you know, I tend to live in the future. And I was saying this to my wife the other day where it's like, I need to stop because I had like, you know, the old line, right? Like what you have now, you, a few years ago, you wish you'd have, you know, you always have right now what you are working towards having, but I live my life so much in the future that I'm really never satisfied with what I have right now. How, how does that, how does that affect you as a father? Uh, so I have four kids. I know. Um, it affects, well, um, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't like to, play i don't i don't like to play games i don't like to play with my kids i like to do stuff and work on projects and stuff so um you know if my kids the other day you know my my kids like to play Fortnite, and they keep saying every night they're like hey can we play Fortnite?" i'm like not tonight not tonight you know uh when we're recording this it's may uh may 1st is the opening for dirt bike season up here in canada uh we have fourteen thousand acres about 30 minutes from our home so my son and i we go dirt biking all the time May 1st. He's like, it's May 1st. We're going dirt biking today. Right. And it's now like been a bunch of weeks. And just today I was like, okay, this weekend, we're definitely going to find time because I'm working right now. I'm working this moment. I'm working. I feel like I'm working every moment that I'm awake to build what will be. And I'm just trying to figure out how to learn to live in the moment and be well, present. But, but, but I'm well, wondering you. if you live in the future. Good for you. Um, you're very early in life to figure that out. I'm 47 and I'm, I'm going through a, a huge moment in my life where this is a, this, it's a very pertinent question that I face. Every Why? Day. What are you, what are you working through right now? Um, well, I mean, I've, you know, I've done eight years of deep psychological work on myself, deep, mm -hmm. a lot, um, from, uh, it started with Tony Robbins events to a ton of talk therapy to, uh, MDMA and LSD with therapists, um, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, a lot of integration, a lot of work, a lot. And, um, I'm a future, I I'm always living in the future. Here's the problem. Uh, I'm going to look back and regret my life if I keep doing that. Yes. And do you, do you have anxiety? Yeah. We, I mean, I, yeah, but it's probably the least it's ever been. Uh, okay, the, the only reason I ask is, um, and I wanted to get into actually this conversation with you. So it's interesting mm -hmm. that it went here anyway, um, because, because I wanted to spend some time understanding, I guess, your journey, your path, even your motivation mm -hmm. towards some of the types of therapy that you've taken. Um, so for me, a few years ago, desperately unhappy, you know, I, I started my mm -hmm. company when I was 23 years old, uh, ran it for, for 14 years, marketing agency, built it into multi-million dollar, not, not huge, 24 staff, um, but just desperately unhappy, you know, unhappy being responsible for every single thing, for every single person, for every single result. Um, running agencies, as you know, means that you are, you are not only building your thing, but you're building everyone else's thing. And that is, that takes a lot of toll. Um, so I went to Tony Robbins too. It started changing things. Well, you know, where, I, where, which event and when? Uh, so uh, my friend, Evan Carmichael mm -hmm. brought me in, 2018 in November, uh, to New Jersey. We went to the New York unleash the power within yeah. now he knows Tony's team. So it was a, we got to sit in CIS, which is nice. Yeah. So we're like in the front row. Yeah. I'm hanging out with like Olympic gold medalists. I'm hanging out with all these people doing these things. It was pretty cool. And then, um, it was actually so powerful. I went then, uh, six months later to Dallas. So I, I went back and, and did it a you second did two, time Two UPWs. Yeah. So, and yeah. And so I, um, I think I want to do the, I, there's more that I want to do, but, but that's yeah, date, really date was with like destiny. That's the, that's the, I've that's done the big two, one. I've done two date with destiny. In fact, the first date with destiny I did with my wife and it was the most defining, uh, event or moment of, of my life because, uh, you go like six days, like 16, 17 hours a day. And on the, on the fifth of the sixth day, it was like 
two in the morning. And there is this moment that I realized that all the problems that I had put on my wife for nine years and blamed her for everything was actually my fault. And I was the one responsible. And they, they split you up at uh, date with destiny. So my wife and I went together, but she was in a different group. I didn't see her most of the week, except like for the three hours you get to sleep a night. And I remember looking across the room and seeing, and I, I, my feeling at that moment was I'd rather be in the corner uh, in the fetal position, sucking my thumb. Like it was that devastating a moment for me that I was the root of all the problems in our marriage. And my wife is like at the same moment, like standing on her chair, arms in the air, screaming freedom because she realizes (laughs) that it was me not her and it's funny now it was the most painful moment i think i've ever gone through and so over the last six years so this is all in 2015 that it did i did like seven events that year um we you know we had to we had we had a moment we was already marriage was either going to make it or not and um i had to get to work and i did and i mean i've done a lot of work since then but um I'm still going through it. I had massive breakthroughs in the last two months that I'm still working through and trying to, trying to, you know, you know, there's a, you know, it's always doing the work, right? Uh, I'm always doing the work, Mark. I, I mean, always. I'm, uh, and then work never ends. And you always discover new things that you are screwing up. And you go, God, I can't believe I could did that. I got to keep working through this stuff. And not like small things, like big things, right? Mm-hmm. And um, the presence thing is a big deal for me. You know, um, how, my daughter, I mean, I'm very aware of it now. Like this morning, I needed to get to work. I took my daughter, I was going to take my daughter to school, but she wanted to play um, a little game before we left for school. And it was, she was going to be late to school. And the game had not finished. And I just asked myself, if you were to die tomorrow or she were to die tomorrow, or I'm to look back in 20 years, does it really matter if she's five minutes late to school or that I need to get into my office and start the day? Cause I got a heavy day. Or is it more important to finish the game without my phone around me and just give her my absolute presence and find some laughter in that moment. And I know obviously the answer is so easy, but it's not easy. I feel pulled to my phone 24 seven, which is something I'm really working. Uh, okay. Okay. So this is interesting to me because I, I'm, I'm working through the same things. I'm trying to do the same things. Yeah. Uh, the other day, um, during the middle of the day, I booked four hours off and I went outside and did some projects I needed to do because mm-hmm. I've been putting them off, putting them off, putting them off. But my kids came outside. It was sunny. It was warm. They're hanging out. We're hanging out. My son's like, this is awesome. We should do this more. And so in that moment, you playing the game, having your daughter be five minutes late, you asking the question, if something were to happen to her, if something would happen to me, what would I cherish more? Of course I would cherish that. I understand that, but I could talk myself out of everything I need to do using that same rationale. Totally. Like like I could find myself living a retired life with no money, with no, no income, not being able to support everyone. And of course I know that I'm taking it to an extreme, but what I struggle with is even just the discernment of which is the moments that, that are moments worth doing and which are the times that you have to, still say no and see the disappointment in their eyes because yeah, you're it, saying no. The, the true moment of involvement is to know that when your kids want you to play Fortnite, it's not about you. And it's not about Fortnite. That it is about that they want to connect with you. And for you mm-hmm. to deny them has a repercussion down the road. And I know this because I did this more times than probably you've ever done. Uh, I was completely absent in my daughter's first year of her life uh, because my, in my mindset and my work brain back in 2012, I thought I work, my wife raises the kids. Like, I know that sounds like a caveman thought, but that's what I modeled. And I my, wife, a step further, my wife gave up her career because she wanted to be at home. So I thought, good, she's at home. I didn't like choose this. She chose to work to, to raise our daughter. Yeah. And I went, great. You, you do that. I work like literally that's how, unconscious I was. And so really the journey I'm on is just a conscious journey. It's, it's to tap into my unconscious brain and be more conscious in my life. And yeah. to know, you know, there's a, a book I'm reading, I'm just finished called the family board meeting. You ever read it? 
I haven't. No, it'll take you 30 minutes. Pick, go, go on Amazon, buy it. The family board meeting. Yeah. It answers that. literally all the questions that you're just talking about right now. Mm. And it's basically that you're each child. And this is really important for people with multiple kids. I have one, right? So this is much easier for me, but that once a quarter, each child gets a half a day with you and you intentionally hold up your phone and throw it in a bucket or throw it in something and say, phone's going off family board meeting. What, get, name me one of your kids names. Give me one Rachel, Rachel, yeah. Rachel phones going off in the bucket for the next four hours. It's so I get to do this and she chooses the activity. <laughs> so th this is super and interesting each, to me. Each kid gets this once a quarter. And it is all of a sudden what happens is your children start coming to you and talking to you about things and asking for your advice, even the teenagers and they open up and they don't turn to their friends or they don't turn to the bully or they don't turn to the bad egg. They turn to you mm. because they trust you. Mm. And yesterday uh, there was a school event for my, my daughter and she's eight and they were out playing in the, I live in on next to the beach in Florida and they had a, like a, a little outing before school got out. Cause we get out in may uh, school gets out in may here. Yeah. You have to start and, in August though. Oof. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and so um, anyway, uh, some boy punched my daughter in the chest twice full on. And she ran up to me and my, and my wife. And she said, you know, crying like this boy punched me and, here's the moment. Like, what do you do in that moment? Now, this is another eight year old boy. Like he's a little boy doesn't know what he's doing. Right. And that's my instinct. My wife's instinct is Philip. She's watching us to see what we're going to do with her telling us this. It's not, she's telling us this, or she's trying to be a tattletale. It's like shh, unconsciously that eight year old daughter is saying "Do my parents stand up for me. Hmm. And so I went, Oh, I mean, I totally blinded this by the way. I'm like, Oh God. Yeah. I see that now. Right. I, I wouldn't have thought that I would have thought like my, my instinct just by my mo the model I know, right. From my past is, Oh, relax. It's toughen up and you'll be fine. And all that stuff. Like that's literally what kicked into my brain. Right. And instead I went up to the parent and I said, I hate to tell you this, uh, your little boy punched my daughter twice and I, I'm not, he doesn't know what he's doing. It's not that big of a deal, but I, well, he apologized to her. And the dad was like, Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Absolutely. I thank you for telling me all this stuff. And then afterwards, my daughter now knows my dad stood up for me. Hmm. Now I didn't make that decision. My wife guided me, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's what it is. And the fact is, is that she came to us because she knew she, she, she knew I, I can go to my parents cause they'll trust me. Yeah. Now my wife is an empath and my wife gets all this stuff. And you know, part of the reason she wants to get rid of me half the time and I'm kidding, but is because I'm totally oblivious to all this stuff, but that's the path I'm trying to work through right now yeah. is to understand that usually there's a great, another book called um, conscious parenting by uh, Dr. Shafali. And that, that book changed my life because it's all about when a child comes to you and says crying or something, it's not that they're having a tantrum. They're trying to tell you something and you can either listen to them or you can shut them up. But if you shut them up, eventually you're going to pay a price for that mm -hmm. later down the road. And, and I think we've kind of gone into this con conscious parenting, um, you know, path for a few years now. And, and man, I have the, I'm very grateful. I just have a free spirited daughter who doesn't like the same things I like. I like the things she likes. Oh, that's cool. You know what, what I've been working through the last few years uh, from a parenting point of view is, so you talked about not being there for the first year. Um, I mean, when my, when my second was born, mm -hmm. I left the hospital because I had to go to work. Like, like it was just me. I had a big project due. Um, we were, it was 2008, we just bought a house. We were young. We put all of our money into it. We, we got, we got the really amazing mortgage of 5%. We were so happy to get 5% mortgage. And then, and then three months later, you know, you know what happened in 2008. Yep. Um, and so it was just like, I wasn't there for the first few years. I remember sitting on the bed one morning. I was so tired that um, my daughter came to me and she was maybe four. She's now turning 15. Um, and 
she was like, and I was so tired that I started crying because I had to leave. Um, and she's like, why are you crying? And it's just like, cause I just can't be here right now. I have stuff I need to do. Um, and I was okay with that because they were little and they were young and I'm like, it's okay. It's okay. But now I have like an almost 15 year old. I have an almost 13 year old. I have a nine year old. And I'm realizing over the last two years that when they are 25 and 35 and 45, when they look back at their childhood, when they have memories, I'm imprinting those right now. Mm. And, and they are old enough to judge me and they're old enough to look back and go, why did dad do that? Why? Like, and that is scaring me so badly. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to operate out of fear, but it's just this realization of like, Oh, like when they were four, cool. Like, yeah, I know the first seven years and then Pritz of brain and stuff, but I, I did the things I needed to do. I wasn't so uptight and worked up and, and, and high strung and back then. Um, but now it's like, Oh, you know, they're going to grow up and parent, based on family of origin, they're going to, they're going to look for partners and spouses based on watching me and my wife. They're going to, um, they're going to go. Yeah. Yeah. My family life was a bit this way or that way based off of the things I'm doing right now. Right. That, that scares me. <laughs> I was, so I had this big question asked to me by my therapist a couple of weeks ago, cause you know, I've got five or six different businesses and we are within about 18 months of being in an area we've never been in and, you know, sort of a, in a good way, like mm -hmm. everything we've, we, we little t quick background. I have all of these businesses have been bootstrapped, no outside investors, no borrowing of any money. We've literally rolled all the profits back in to reinvest or start the other one. And they're all kind of coming together. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I'm also struggling with all the things you're talking about. And my therapist says, Philip, you can have all the success and all the money you want that just be solely focused on that. You'll have it all, but I promise you everything else will fall apart. And that's what you see. And if you really look deep behind the layer of almost every person that you see, that's solely focused on their work eventually it falls apart or it's not real to begin with, or it's false or whatever. So you can, you can go have all that success that you've worked hard for, but you need to know there's a consequence to that with your family, uh, with, with your, you know, just loving yourself. Like, like that's my big struggle right now. How do I even love myself? I, I never, never grew up loving myself. I don't have any model of loving myself. And Why so one, I mean, but, I know that's a really easy yeah, question. But, but to my ask point, my point it. ultimately is you can, you can go 24 seven. Like I like to, cause I'm so like, it, it's funny as we started this conversation on my ADD, but I am so focused on the work stuff. But the problem is, is that the marriage suffers, the ch children suffer, uh, who you are as a human being suffers, but you can have all that success. Shouldn't you? And there's no doubt you'll have all that success. So what do you want? And you have to make a choice and that's hard because you put so much into the belief that what you're doing is right for mm -hmm. so long mm -hmm. and you know that it's not. And now you got to change <laughs> that change sucks and it sucks. And it's great. Like the reward on the other side of the change is amazing, but knowing you have to, uh, you have to change that and yeah. know that, you know, otherwise I may have a broken marriage. My kid may hate me or cause a lot of damage in her own. I may be causing a lot of damage in her own life. Like I, these are the consequences and I know them. And that's why I'm trying my best right now to work through all those. So does, if I can does everything get this deep with you? With me, usually yeah. I yeah, okay, tend to good. intimidate people most of the time. <laughs> no, I love this stuff. <laughs> usually I just, I, gotta, always wanna gotta, know why. I, I like talking about this. Like, honestly, this is how I talk to somebody having a beer with them. So I got to get to Toronto. We got to have a beer and just do more of the sauna. I'll come to, I'll come to Florida. Yeah, I mean, you need we, to, have, actually, we have a place just outside that. of Jensen beach, which we can't visit right Where's now. Where's Jensen? So. Jensen beach is uh, just an hour North. Of, it's just outside of Stewart. It's an hour North of West Palm beach. Oh, okay. on the, yeah. on the uh, I'm about 10 hour drive from there. Oh, where are you in Florida? I'm in the Panhandle, the Northern Panhandle, a ah, town called Santa okay. Beach. Yeah, yeah, I've I've driven through there to go to other places. <laughs> there you go. That's usually what we hear, which is good. You should not. And we don't want people to come. We like it where we are. I love it. I love it. I, I wanted to ask about um, about what led, I guess, to you know. I don't even know what term to use from just a thera therapeutic point of view, what kind of reprogramming, what mm. led to the use of substances to help with reprogramming from a, from a therapy I, point I, of view? Yeah. I feel like I hit a ceiling with talk therapy. Okay. 
Um, and I just couldn't get, I, I mean, I, so I don't, I still do talk therapy, but I didn't feel like what I was working through. I, 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 I've kind of hit a ceiling with it. I just felt like I, I, I couldn't break through anymore. Um, and I needed help. And, yeah. um, luckily I've had some really good guides that started me. I did a MDMA session, which is ecstasy with a therapist, probably one of the, probably the foremost therapist in, in the world on it, uh, up in New York in 2019. And it was one of the most, fi I, I described it like this, uh, Mark, it was, uh, 35 years of a black cloud that hung over my head was erased in five hours uh, after the MDMA, MDMA session. I didn't fix it. I, I understood uh, a trauma that I had hoped no one could see in my life. And I, and I hid and I, um, I uncovered it. And then I spent a, a year with a therapist working through that trauma hmm. and forgiving that trauma. And then uh, in January of 2020, before everything went side, sideways, uh, I went back and we did um, uh, MDMA and then we stacked it with LSD because LSD with MDMA, it, my ego is so strong that it almost didn't kick in. Like I took an, you know, like it, it's supposed to kick the, the MDMA kicks in like 30 minutes. It took like three hours for it to kick in because I didn't want, to anything to control me. I want to control everything. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, the, you know, my, my, the guy, the people that guided me were like, okay, well you haven't, you know, you have a strong ego, not in the sense of like, I I'm, you know, bragging on myself all the time. I just have a strong will. And so they're like, well, we're going to put some LSD in this because it wipes out your ego. Like almost in 15 minutes. It's very scary. I've never done a drug in my life ever. I never smoked pot, mm -hmm. never did anything. So th these two things are the only times I've ever done drugs and, in my entire and, life. And I know that you approached it from a clinical point of view. Correct. I'm sure that you had a lot of trust that it was, that it was very monitored and, and cared for. And I, yes. and everything that I'm learning about this, I think that this is going to be, this is going to be very popular in the future as a treatment. Oh, setting. it's going to be ma It's about Massive. to be legal in the United States. Yeah. Now, very but close. The, but the question I have is you were talking about this openly I know about this because I've heard you speak about this openly. Mm -hmm. um, having never done drugs or anything like that, how did how did you overcome whatever judgment there might be, or even fear of judgment from others? I mean, I don't. I know I that some people make, in Silicon Valley are talking about this, but not a lot of people. Yeah, people don't make change until the pain's too great, and I had a lot of pain, mm -hmm. and so I needed to get through that pain, and I needed to figure it out, and I was very confused, and I couldn't work through it with a therapist, and so um, uh, a buddy of mine wrote a, a big article on it. And it spoke to me and I said, that's exactly what I need. Like I, I need this. Like I knew I needed it and how, how much, how scared I am. And I think, I think through a lot of failure in my life and a lot of pain, I'm pretty good with just making decisions and going for it, whether it works out or not. It's another question, but, um, so yeah, I mean, that was the reason. And then the second one, I did it with the LSD and yeah, my ego wiped out in, in 15 minutes and I went on a, you know, MDMA LSD trip uh, with, by the way, in that session, my wife was with me in the room hmm. with the therapist. And uh, that lasted about five or six hours and another incredible experience. And then now I'm exploring ayahuasca um, and I've got a really good ayahuasca guide um, that I'd, I'd work with. Uh, I've just got to figure out the time to do it. That is very scary to me because the difference between sort of the MDMA uh, sessions, even with the LSD, you didn't have any kind of out of body experience or any kind of trip. I mean, it, you're very conscious of everything going on in your brain. My, remember, it's not like I'm out and dancing and music and stuff like that. Like I literally am in a room laying on a sofa or a bed with a blindfold on. So everything goes internally in these sessions. And so um, the ayahuasca is something totally different. I'm, it's, you know, it's a hallucination. That's for a, a, a strong ego person like me, that is super scary. But uh, I just think there's some things in my life I, I can't get beyond with enough talk therapy. I've integrated that last MDMA session for over a year now. Mm -hmm. And I figure I had, I've got a wall and I need to break through that wall. And here's the thing. I'm always going to do the work. There's work to do. 
99% of people become 75 years old and regret their life and or regret their choices or wish they had done things. And so I'm trying to solve that now. Mm. And I'm trying to make sure when I'm 75 or 77, I say, I got a great life. I did everything. I did the hard work. There's a, I can't think of the guy's name of the, of the guy who said this quote, but it's um, hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. And I think people that go unconscious their whole lives make a lot of easy choices, yes. but they're riddled with uh, stress and regret. And I think yeah. people that make hard choices, it is so not easy in the moment, um, but they live without regret and they're present as it, to go back to your original question way a long time ago. Anyway, and that's how I kind of look at it. This is the very premise of what I'm like this show. This is just the very premise of it. So I, so thank you for being so masterful to take it right there. You know, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, um, the five regrets of the dying by Bonnie Ware. I want to get it right. Uh, where is it on my shelf? The five. Yeah. Yes. The five regrets of the dying by Bonnie Ware. So uh, a few weeks ago, I, I mean, I heard about this before, but a few weeks ago I picked it up and I started working through it. And, um, you know, she, she, she writes, um, I think through amazing stories and moves through time, but she each, she was a PSW or she was an end of life, uh, care person, um, in Australia and each of her regrets are tied to a personal story. And I'm listening to these regrets and I'm thinking, I, I don't want, I don't want to hit, you know, 80 or 90 or whatever, God willing, I'm able to live to and have these regrets. Right. I'm 38. I have time to change. Yeah. So I hit this moment where I go, okay, I believe that I will have these regrets. I believe that what these people are saying is truth because they're staring death in the face and they have no reason to lie. So it's truth. I'm going to make changes today to avoid those regrets in the future. That's a hard choice, right? But here's the thing. I'm stepping out in faith that these people know what the hell they're talking about. Just because they regret it at the end right. of their life doesn't mean it, it's actually will work out as truth. And, sure. and that, that gap is, is the part right now that's scaring me. Like, like can, I, can I live today and act today and be bold today and do everything I need to do today as if it, was, as if it will all work out, avoiding that regret, regret but there's a big valley or chasm or room even just for it, like mm -hmm. not really even work out just because you regret it doesn't mean that right. it's truth or not truth. And that's, right. that's something I'm experimenting with right now. Good for you, man. <laughs> well, you got to let me know how it goes. <laughs> I, I guess so. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I need, I need time. Go, and a few uh, the years easy for one to do right? is just go read the family board meeting. It literally take you 30 minutes. It's a small little book. And yes. that is, that's a really powerful one too. I'm telling yes. you. I love it. And so, um, okay. So, so we, we've covered a few topics that I, that I definitely like, while I had you, I definitely wanted to speak to, um, let's, I, I don't want to get over the therapy thing. So, so you're, so you're <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I just, I have a few more questions. So like your, your wife is with you in this, you're planning your next thing. You have another roadblock. Are you wor like, are you worried at all about becoming addicted to progress? And just one thing leads to the next thing leads to the next thing. Like, when can you stamp, like, you're never done. Yeah. But when can you be right. like, yeah, I've done it. I can move yeah. on to the next thing. Right. Um, that's another thing that I'm kind of going through right now, which is the boundaries of it. Right. Mm. So before I've had no boundaries on it and now I'm trying to put boundaries on the progress. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's just something I'm working through. I don't have an answer. Okay. I mean, <laughs> no, answer, no so worries. <laughs> no worries. Okay. So switching gears back to, back to kind of your progress. So, you know, you talked about the fact you started your own company, yeah. um, you're running all these companies, you bootstrapped them and they're all coming together. And now you're at the kind of precipice for what's yeah. next. Yeah. Right. Um, but you put out this book, right? You put out the, the undefeated marketing system, which is yeah. like, which is, which is like a collection of many, many, many years of systems and proven tactics that you want to try and take from the, the lessons of politics uh, to the corporate world. Right. Why? I mean, like, like in my experience, and I've heard you even say it, the vast majority of corporate people don't want to do the thing that works. 
they would much rather do the thing that makes them feel good and spend all the budget. Oh, the biggest struggle I have. Someone asked me today, what do I hate the most? And I go business. I call them committed versus interested. You may remember this. Uh, how many times I made the mistake of working with a company as it, to market their business. And they were, they told me, Oh, we're all in, we're going to do this. And then three months later they go, this is hard. Where's the, where's the shiny object? Where's the get rich quick pill. That's why I want to say, you know, most business owners hate marketer marketing. They hate it. Mm -hmm. And so they want it fast and easy. And I just read, you know, the other thing is, um, the marketing game is, is a thousand percent rigged against 99.9% .9 of business owners, a thousand percent rigged against them. Okay. And what I mean by that is there are a couple stats um, that I'll, I'll read you there. Forbes has a stat out right now that they were saying up to 10,000 ads a day online and off day uh, online and offline 10,000. So you're not compete. If you're selling hair care products, N nothing against you, Mark. Um, they, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, just didn't. I can't help the fact that I'm going bald, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you're selling hair care products, then, um, you're not competing against other hair care products. You're competing at shoe companies, mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, uh, art companies, food companies, Yeti, like you're, you're competing against everybody. Right. And unless you know, and have a s sort of formulaic systematic approach to marketing, you're going to lose every time. But, the, this is, you know, since you come from the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Evan Carmichael, the, um, there's a stat out came out just a couple of weeks ago by uh, media kicks. And it says there are only 3000 YouTube influencers right now that have over a million subscribers, but there are 5 million YouTube subscribers right now with around a thousand subscribers. And that's in a way a metaphor for how a business owner should look. There are only a few that are winning the game every time. And typically, um, you know, is that they don't like marketing. They, every, every company that comes into my ecosystem says, Oh, we ran a bunch of Facebook ads. It didn't work. I hate this marketing thing. I've hired, fired three marketing agencies. Oh, it's the worst. And I'm like, what, what was your, what was your strategic plan in your marketing? Facebook? And I'm like, all right, God, Jesus. <laughs> Like, you know, like this is what I always see. So what drives me the most nuts is, yeah, the business owners that are what I call interested, not committed. Now we have, we've made that adjustment in our company. So we only work with committed business owners and everybody that follows our system in the committed business owner category has grown their bottom line. And so what I'm trying to do is take the guesswork out of marketing and turn it into a science. And I did it because I worked on and worked on winning presidential campaigns. And there's a formula that we use in those campaigns that when we applied them to businesses grew every single business uh, that we worked with since we implemented it five years ago. And I decided to write a book. See, on it. I, I, and I love this because, um, you know, for the last few years, I have, it, I really have believed that marketing should be predictable. And I bump up against people who believe, you know, the quadrants between, you know, like chaos and, and all of these things, mm -hmm. they really believe that most of these platforms or ecosystems are just pure chaos that, that, you know, even if you're able to rapidly prototype and, and run everything as small tests and then go through, you know, scaling, um, even then it's unpredictable and, and it can't, it can't never, it can never yes. be predictable. And you always have to stay on top of everything and it yes. always has to be actively managed and, and you have no idea about uh, seasons and, and you can't even really predict why things are the way they are. Cause they work sometimes and don't work. Like, honestly, I, it's like, I know that if you have principles and if you follow the principles and you trust, you, you run tests and you trust data and you do all of those things, yeah. it should work. But the truth is sometimes it still doesn't work, which just, drives me crazy <laughs> yeah and i well that you just said something that's the key to the whole thing um if you believe your business sells shoes then you're going to lose if you believe that your business is a data company that also sells shoes then you're going to win mm. that's it on a bumper sticker so, so it's, it's the Domino's pizza approach that they went into many years ago which is we're not going to sell pizzas we're going to become a tech and data company yeah totally that's why they win that's why they're dominoes. Uh, Facebook is not a social media platform. It's a data company that has social media platform. Google is not a search engine. It's a data company that also has a search engine. Uber is not a rideshare 
company. It is a data company that has ride sharing and food delivery. Mm -hmm. And I could go on and on and on. And the people that win the marketing game understand that. And I understand that because in politics, all I ever care about, I love the politician, but I really am obsessed with the voter. And so I've got to learn through a lot of data and a lot of work in data. And that's really what the root of this whole book is how do you understand your customer and client better and then put yourself in a position that no matter what the rules change on the social platforms, you can still win every time. And that's what we found. Like I, we were talking with a, we we're onboarding a new client today. This is a true story. And we, I, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I don't know. That's so weird to say something like that. So. It's like, I say all the time, like, well, I'm going to be honest this, with you. And they're like, yeah, well, yeah, I hope but so. it's a, this huge realization. Like we had, we did an audit of them when that, before they came on board today. And we found out that they were bidding in three different places on Google for the same AdWords. So what they were doing was they were bidding raising, against themselves. They were bidding against themselves. Yeah. And now when they started that three years ago, they weren't bidding against themselves. But Google has changed the rules. Now they are, and they had no idea. And I was like, "Do you know how much money has gone down the drain because you're bidding against yourself?" And they're like, "Oh my God!" You know. And so um, that's the whole point. Is like you've got to understand what you're doing. You've got to understand what you're. And I'm obsessed with customers. And it's, you know, my thing is I'm obsessed with uh, finding deeper connections with the people that we want to buy from and sell to. Uh, we live in a in a, you know, I, again this again this may be my age. I didn't grow up with the internet. I didn't get an email until I was 22 and that was in 1996. And my, uh, my wife helped me sign up for my first email. Yeah. And, what uh, and, and I mean, we were teenagers cause we met in, in uh -huh. high school. We've been together 21. Today's our anniversary. Actually hey, we've been together 20, 21 years, married 16. She helped me sign up for an email account on Hotmail. Oh yeah, I know. I mean, I, I the first email I signed up for on Yahoo, the guy said, "Whatever you do, don't put your name on that because they'll they'll steal everything." And yeah. so my name, my my first email that I still have that I sent all the junk stuff to, like it's still this random email that has no no no. Mine sense was whatsoever. "Man in the Suitcase" at yeah, Hotmail.com, like <laughs> named after a police <laughs> song. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but uh, but so my thing is like. Where I grew up, if you wanted to have a connection with people, you saw them face to face or the very worst, you picked up the phone and talked to them. That was, that was it. That was all. It was either seeing, but, and so what I, that's not a, um, that's not a realistic world anymore. So what I want to try to do is figure out how do you make deep, deep connections with your customers so that they become raving fans of your product and service. That's what I'm obsessed with. And so really the book was about how do we make deeper connections with the people uh, we want to buy and buy from us. And, you know, maybe that goes back to a little connecting into the psychology conversation we had earlier, mm -hmm. which is I'm trying to make deeper connections with my family right now. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe a little less connected to the uh, unemotional business and maybe more connected to the emotional people in my life. And I think, but that's what I'm obsessed with in the works. It's very, you know, it's very weird. Uh, that's kind of the, the connection, but yeah. the corollary. Well, so, so, if you if you're in the if you live in the future uh, and you're working on that, if you tend to be anxious, but I also know you're an entrepreneur. I also know you've had health issues. I'm, I know you have a lot swimming around you. Here's here's the question I have for you: as someone who runs multiple businesses, who've done yeah. all of these things, how do you not allow the gap between where you need to be or feel yeah. like you should be or where other people are and where you actually are? How do you not let that crush you? Because like, I, I, I look at what you're doing and I, and I listen to how you're running your business. I was like, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted my agency to be. Mm. But rather than try to figure it out or go out there and do it, I was just like, you know, it takes what it takes and I'm not willing to do what it takes to mm. do it. So how, how do you allow that, that whatever closing that gap is, how do you not let that gap crush you? Uh, well, I mean, it's crushed me plenty. And I mean, try support you know the in 2015 i'm 41 years old i didn't become a real entrepreneur until i was 41 2015 uh, a real what's the difference between a well real a solopreneur one man operation being a consultant to politicians okay. Okay. and then in 2000 beginning of 2015 uh, i started my uh, my political first company, which is the political ad agency. And since then we've added other companies into that. Mm -hmm. In the first year I'm 41. My daughter is three, two and a half, three years old. And I made $52,000 in 2015, not that long ago. 
Mm -hmm. Imagine that, that that's soul crushing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I'm, I'm, I so believe in what I'm doing, Mark. I really do that. I am willing to punt the reward almost every time. That's what's in my fiber of my being. Now that puts a lot of stress on my family. It's easy for me. I don't care. I, I mean, literally my wife, you know, it, it drives her nuts. Like I could literally stay at a, at a cheap motel on a trip. Like I don't need anything. Like I, I just want to pursue these. I love the businesses, but that's not what I married. That's not what my daughter wants. That's not it. And then maybe, maybe it's not what I want. Ultimately, yeah. I just never allowed myself, gave myself to explore that within me. So it, there's part of it that has crushed me. Um, I still am very passionate about it. Look, I'm always going to work. That's not going to go away. I'm always going to be passionate about what I do. I want to write more books. By the way, I'm not writing a book anytime soon. <laughs> one, this is my second. And this one almost killed me because I wrote it during COVID where I'm trying to like save an at all my businesses. And, you know, it was just so that was soul crushing. Uh, and I'm, I'm working myself out of that. And so I really put myself on about a two year plan to get to where I need to get to and then to start easing my hours back so that for the last eight years of my daughter's life, um, I'm more available, but I put too many things out there and I started too many things and I can't see them go. I've sacrificed too much. And so I'm committed to seeing this through. And then, and then I'm not going to stop working. I'm just not going to work 60, 70 hours a week. You know, I mean, I go to 30 or 40. So I have a plan is, I guess my, that's my thing. And my, and I've worked with it with my, my wife and in my, you know, my partners and things like that. Yeah. And now I got to keep my word because I put it out there. Right. I kind of burn, I, I'm a, you know, the whole burn your boats. To, if you want to take the island, burn your boat. So I'm, I, I literally burn every boat every time. And sometimes I don't take the island. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, but but i'm willing to burn my boats every time so in this instance of what you're asking for i literally have given myself a two-year two-year timeline to and I've, I've put it out there and i now have to keep my word yeah i love you know i i don't know what it is about maybe i, I don't know if other people are like this or not um I've always said that if I had to start like a business with my hands and whatnot, I'd want to start a demolition company Interesting. because, because I love deconstructing things. Yeah. I don't really like putting them back together. Right? Yeah. Like, like, yeah. like, like when you deconstruct something, when you burn the boats, when you're just like, yeah, we're clearing house or yeah. like, yeah, this change is happening. Right. Like, once you make the emotional decision, every step after that is just like fast and gets you closer to your goals. Building is so slow, so hard, so yeah. much work. Um, now, and, and that's one of those things where I don't know if it's that everyone's like that, that everyone would rather come in, clear house, like do all that stuff because it's just easier. It feels faster. Yeah. It looks better. Um, but the build, man, is like, it's the build's slow, a, it's hard. I, yeah. I, listen, here, here's the secret that I've learned from me. Um, building alone is hard and painful building with a complimentary partner is the the difference between happiness and depression <laughs> there's a quote. And there's made, an ig I've quote right the there right we're gonna decision. we're gonna pull that clip yeah i've pulled made the right decision on a couple of my businesses and i made a wrong decision on a couple of my businesses in that regard and so now that i know that like i have a a, a rule no business gets started unless i have a complimentary player hmm. with me it's a good rule yeah that's a good rule well, li- listen, man, this is like, honestly, it's been so much fun connecting and talking to you. Uh, uh, let me, let me ask you, I guess this one question. So we've, cir- we've circled around on a whole bunch of different things. Uh, I like to end with this because usually it helps get to the meat and potatoes of what really matters. So for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Loving myself. Because if I love myself, then I can give to everybody in my life. But if I don't love myself, then I'm just acting. And what, I know you're working towards it, but what's, what's kept you from being able to do that? I don't know who I am in my deep down side of my psychology. I'm trying to figure out what is it that makes me happy? And I'm on a journey on it. I've, I've I've made a lot of progress on that. Um, whether, you know, I never gave myself a moment off ever, right? It'd be a hundred hours of work and then 
20 hours of family and then like nothing for myself. Never. I never allowed myself anything. I felt guilty if I gave myself anything. So like, I'm just starting to do things for myself for the first time and allowing myself to be good with it and be not feel guilty over it. And, um, I'm allowing myself to be flawed and know that that's who I am and I'm okay with that. And if someone else isn't, that's on them. And, um, but it, it has to start with me and I can't give all and be everything that we've kind of talked about unless I truly just love who I am. And I'm, I'm, probably 25, 30% there. And I think the the rest of my life, I'll be getting a little bit closer, kind of like building one of those businesses. It's a lot of hard work and you make incremental progress. That was a really interesting conversation, wasn't it? I kind of feel like Philip and I could be friends. Okay, three key takeaways from this talk. Number one, too many business owners are interested rather than committed. Business has never been about getting rich quick. It takes commitment, a long-term strategy, and it needs to be data-driven. Number two, if you only focus on business goals like money and other achievements, everything else in your life, family, health, it will all fall apart. And number three, hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. It's kind of our whole mission here at We Do Hard Things. Put in the work of making hard decisions that will in turn make your life better than having to deal with a life full of regrets. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, then you've gotta face the difficult, the scary, and the hard things in your life. It's not easy, it's never easy. But remember, you, me, we, we're not just dreamers, we're doers, because we do hard things. If you've not heard the conversation that I had with the motivational legend, Les Brown, where we get into some of the toughest moments in his life, you have got to hear this story. Click on the link right over there and I will see you there.